All right, last week was uh, part one of, of 2023, and, and actually it's beyond 2023. I'm thinking of, of going on in the coming years. And it was mainly bad news. And we had some people who weren't here last week, and it's not fair to the rest of you guys that they should escape having some bad news, because I'm an equal opportunity dispenser of bad news. So... Uh, I want to kind of review last week, and then we're going to go into this week talking about the good news and what we can do and what the answers are. So last week I, I was talking about, you know, I, personally I don't get like visions or pictures. Some people do. Mine is usually just comes from impressions from the Lord, and then I usually try to uh, find a, a prophetic voice that kind of saying that same thing and, and then kind of confirmate, you know, confirms it. And so these are some things that, that I just feel like coming this year. Um, and some things are just practical, no knowledge. Like, you know, every Barnes uh, study that they do about Christians and the churches and believers show that the numbers are going down steadily, especially Bible believing. Christian, those who really stand for the Word of God, even saying a lot of pastors do not believe in the fundamentals of our Christian faith. And so there's there's been a decline in biblical understanding and knowledge and those who are staying faithful in it. And I just kind of believe that we are under, as a nation, a limited judgment, meaning all God's judgments are redemptive. They're for a purpose. They're they're to draw us back to the Lord. It's to wake us up, just like he did through Israel and Judah throughout the years of history of the Old Testament. Uh, So my overall thing was that things are not going to get better in 2023 in the natural, okay? It's important I say in the natural because in the spiritual, that's a whole different ballgame. The economy is going to continue to be shaken. Uh, I I believe inflation is going to continue to be a problem. And that we will be entering a recession this coming year, if not already in it. The economy of the world is going to be shaken as far as that goes. There's going to be increased conflicts between nations. We're going to see uh, the division within our country is going to increase, which is already pretty bad as it is. I had another one, and this was just mine personally, but it was a watch and pray for Mexico, that I just believe that Mexico is in danger of becoming another Haiti. And if that happens, that's a very dangerous to us because we have that shared border. And there's something about a mixture of cartel and satanic worship that is festering such an evil thing that I think something's going to happen in our nation so violent and so hideous that it's going to shock our nation and what is happening. There's not all, all just immigrants that are coming over. Uh, the culture war is going to intensify, which will bring an in, uh, increase in persecution, especially over LGBTQT and trans, transgenderism. And that persecution will cause some churches to begin to compromise and to give in because they don't want to be persecuted. Uh, I, I did read about the Apostolic Council of Prophetic Elders, which is a whole group of people, Cindy Jacobs and uh, uh, Jim Gall is involved and Chuck Pierce and a whole herd of different people each year come together before the first year, and they put their minds together and asking the Lord what they see. And a lot of the same things that I have been seeing, but one other thing was that they believe World, world War III is going to take place in the future, and it can still be delayed due to prayer. And for 10 years, they have seen an alliance between uh, Russia, China, and Iran. And we're beginning to start to see that now. A lot more exposures in politics. Things coming to light, but not only in politics, also in the church. There's going to be 
things that have been exposed in the church that are going to bring some churches down and, and some church leaders down. And then I went into this whole thing. I'm not going to go through it, but does persecution always bring about revival or growth in the church? And I gave some example like China and Vietnam where it did. But in the case of Ephesus, which was a revival center in the first century, it was where the, the greatest revival took place. And then we followed it on through the book of Revelation, where the, the, the word uh, that came to the church at Ephesus about losing their first love, and how today, uh, in what was then Asia Minor, referred to Asia usually in it through the book of Acts, that all those seven churches were in there, were in that what is now modern-day Turkey, and now the, the amount of Christians in Turkey is 0.02%. So we have to ask ourselves what happened. That Christian witness was pretty well snuffed out. So, and just to add a couple other maybe bad news parts, but not bad, I just, because sometimes I think we, we have a bias. As Americans, we see... This is the United States of America, and we are patriotic, and it, it's good to be patriotic to a certain degree. But in Luke chapter 19, I just want to read you a little passage, 41 through 44. This is Jesus, and it says, As he approached Jerusalem, and he saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, If, you, if even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace... But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So that's happened about 35, 38 years later, 70 A.D., the Romans come in and completely destroy, and over a million Jews are killed. And it says, because they did not recognize the time of God coming to them. And their thought was, well, you know, the temple, this is the temple. The temple is here in Jerusalem. We have the old covenant. We have the, the covenant of God. It, it will never happen here. And I think sometimes we have that same outlook. It'll never happen here. Yeah, it's happening over there, but it'll never happen here. And then just in Luke 23, where Jesus is being led to the cross, and the women are falling behind him, and they're weeping and wailing, and then he turns to them and says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself, for what is coming. So there was warnings, and it came. And I, I was listening to a, an old Bob Jones interview this week, actually. And he, he said a lot of times some of the prophets will prophesy patriotism rather than the truth of God, what he's actually saying, because it, it can seem to be negative, and, they and it seems to be wrong. It's just, it's just like Jeremiah, you know, in the time of, of Judah, when he kept warning about the Babylonians, they're going to come if you guys don't turn. And they, they called him a traitor, locked him up. Okay? So sometimes we don't want to hear those things. All right, so enough bad news. Now we'll, we'll do a switch and we'll go to some good news. Okay? And I'm going to use the main scripture I'm going to use is actually out of Malachi. Malachi chapter 8. It's the last book of the Old Testament. And I'm going to focus on verse 18, but I'm going to read 16 through 18. And it says, Then those who feared the Lord, they talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in His presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored His name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in that day when I make up my treasured possessions. I will spare them 
just as in compassion a man, a man spares his son who serves him. And here's the key verse. And when you, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who fear him. So he says, and again, you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. That needs to be a, a, actually a prayer point, a prayer for us to begin to pray into that. And you notice he said, and again. So what's the again referring to? What was he referring back in the past to? And also, by the way, it says, uh, look, before I get to there, let's go on down to chapter 4. Uh, because he also says, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. So if you can kind of picture that. But as for you, you who are serving the Lord, you who are being faithful, there can be a distinction. But again, going back to that, what did they again refer back to? Well, it refers back to the Exodus. Okay, if you, it refers back to something uh, that we refer to as the, the Goshen Principle. If you remember, okay, after Joseph died and uh, uh, another Pharaoh rose and he enslaved the people, and then Moses is brought in, and he comes back, and, and he, you know, is talking with Pharaoh, and, and he says, uh, uh, and the Lord tells him he's going to bring different judgments upon the nation of e- Egypt. And in Exodus 8, he says, but in verse 23, he says, but on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. So if you remember, the first few miracles, or not miracles, judgments that were done, the magicians of, of uh, Egypt, or the Pharaoh, was able to duplicate those things. So that shows that there is power in the occult and in black magic. And then they got to the point where the gnats filled the land, and they could not do that. They tried, couldn't do it, and they tell Pharaoh, this is nothing but the finger of the Lord, okay? And so from that point on, the Lord makes a distinction. You have Goshen, where all the Israelites live, right there within the country, Egypt. They didn't have any of the plagues came upon them. And so that's referring back to that that principle of what is called the Goshen principle. And in Micah seven fifteen, he says, As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will also show you my wonders. Now, a scripture I think probably everybody is familiar with is Isaiah 60. And verse 1. And it says, Arise and shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the people. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory will appear over you. So in a time of great darkness, it says, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness the people. And if you think about the thick darkness, that's talking about deception. In other words, things that they will believe that for us would just seem like, well, it's just common sense. How could could you even believe that? How could you even stand for that? It's because of the deception. It says in the last day, deception will be one of the major issues we have to deal with, that even the elect could fall under that. But arise and shine. Because in that time, that's our hour. That's our time to shine. So even though the times are going to get harder, more difficult, you won't be bored for sure. Because it's your hour to shine, to go forth. 
Now, another name for the Goshen principle would be places of refuge. Now, what are places of refuge? In fact, we've had probably in the last 10 years, a lot of people have been doing this. They've been preparing. And that can be a home. It could be a home group. It could be a church. It could be a, a town. It could even be a city. And I don't like to use the, the term city of refuge just because if you go to the Old Testament, there was a different connotation with that, which meant where the manslayer was to, was to flee. But this is the place of refuge where God provides supernatural protection. And sometimes I like to use the word uh, limited immunity because not necessarily everything will be spared for. But there's a place with both spiritual and natural resources and limited immunity. There was a book written by uh, a guy by the name of Craig Cook. He was actually the, the leader of the Evansville House of Prayer. And very interesting, uh, just showing what people are doing, how people are beginning to prepare. God's giving them dreams. They're giving them visions. They're beginning to prepare places of refuge. And he said not every house of prayer will become a place of refuge, but every place of ref refuge must be birthed by the house of prayer. So these places of refuge represents God's mercy in the coming storm. So God has called us all to be during that time when people are looking for answers, they don't understand what's going on, and, and, and people who maybe never were would give you the time of day, all of a sudden, because of all the shakings, all the things that are happening, everything that seems to be out of control, they're going to be looking for people who have, who have answers. And these places of refuge, they're completely of humble, contrite people who know how to become and be carriers of his presence. So when you carry his presence, because, you know, the word says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he will raise up a standard. So as, a, as the time gets darker and there's an increase of evil, there's going to be an increase of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit that's going to correspond to that, that we're going to see and we're going to walk in. So we should both expect to see the supernatural, supernatural provision, but we should also make practical preparation. If you think about Joseph, okay, Joseph, you know, he sent him to, to Egypt as a slave and, you know, the dream that, that Pharaoh had about the seven lean years and and then the, or the seven bountiful years, and then the seven lean years where there'd be a famine. And he interprets that dream. Well, why didn't, why didn't Joseph just say, we bind that in the name of Jesus. We're not going to have those seven years come. In Jesus' name, I proclaim it. Didn't do that. What did he do? He began to make practical preparations. He began to build, he began to store same thing with Agabus. You know, Agabus uh, in Acts, you know, he comes to Antioch and he tells him, a great famine is coming. But he didn't say, let's bind that thing in Jesus' name. No, they made practical preparation. Preparing for what they knew was coming. And in that case, they were going, actually taking collections for the church back in Jerusalem. Now, Brittany mentioned a while ago about, about Nathan and uh, his job situation. And Jesse is in the kind of same boat about now, looking for what is next. And I think we need to be praying for them, not just for jobs, but for something that would be very fulfilling and also meet uh, the provision for them and their families, obviously. And it made me think about I think every time Glenn and I made a major change in life, it was always at the worst time economically. It was like, why now? <laughs> you know? and, 
And I remember that time when we, did, we made that decision after our, our youngest uh, son was born that we were, we were going to homeschool. She was teaching at the time, and we just felt like we were to home. And this was back in the 80s, early 80s, when we didn't know much about homeschooling. And we made that decision, but then when I put my pencil to it and figured out, okay, if she quits, ooh, <laughs> this is not going to add up, you know. And so what we did, she took her, her retirement she had. I think she had worked eight years in Hickman Mills District teaching. And um, we took that and we put it in a CD. We figured, well, we'll supplement our income from that. Well, as it turned out, we never even had to touch that. And as it turned out, God provision, I got promotions and different things happened. And when, I don't know how many years later, we ended up paying off the house. Of course, the interest rates at that time were like 14, 15% for a CD. So it doesn't take long for it to double, triple, you know. And, but anyway, just things like that. And, and when I, I got promoted one time to another job, and I had it for a year, and then all of a sudden they eliminated it nationwide. And I'm going, oh, great. You know, got, thank you, Lord. We got a promotion, but it didn't last long. And, uh, but, you know, at that time I was working clear downtown, so I was driving, and we had moved out here by Drexel. So I had a over a hundred mile drive, you know, all the time, and and it's interesting how the Lord provided. So the Lord provided actually a job, and they said, "What what do you want to do? You know, what would you?" And and so I got I actually got a position, an officer in charge, a peculiar, and then I went to Adrian, the postmaster, and then Drexel, just six miles from home. So here I was driving, started driving one hundred some miles, and driving six miles, and and because. My other job I had was a higher level than these other jobs. They gave me a saved grade, so I had to save salary. So it was like, Lord, thank you. Now, during that time, I had a, a, a general over a sense of peace, but at the same time, I met, just kind of nervous inside, you know, what's this going to look like, and how's this going to happen, and is it going to happen, you know. But generally, there was a, a, a general peace over it, and God, God was faithful. So I just want to encourage you with that. Yeah, we'll see what the next step is, what that looks like. We'll hope it even includes the opportunity for ministry, you know, in some way. Now, going back to a place of refuge, and, and it's not like this is automatic. You know, Revelation 18.4 says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. So there is a responsibility in our part to press into the Lord, to realize that sometimes the world, instead of the, the church evangelizing the world, a lot of times the world has evangelized the church. And that we need to examine ourselves and just see where we're at. You know, when back in uh, you know, the church at Ephesus, when it says, you've lost your first love. We need to go back and say, have I lost my first love? Have I, has my fire grown cold? And as I said earlier, the LGBTQ and the transgenderism was, is going to be persecution. And as I was praying about this, you know, one thing I, I think how we have to approach it is we don't condemn, but we don't condone. Okay, and that takes wisdom. How do you do that? If you think about that, how do you? you we don't want to be the Westboro Baptist Church, all right? You're yeah, going to hell, you know that type of thing. But we also don't want to condone and say, "Well, you," because if, if Jesus loves them, and He loves them, but He loves them too much to stay the same, He has deliverance. He has help to get them out, and a. Which made me think of an example that uh, Jesus did in John chapter 8. I'm going to read John chapter 8, 1 through 11. And it says, But Jesus went to Mount Olives at dawn, and he appeared again in the temple court where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. 
Now the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. It's funny, they brought a woman in. Where was the guy? Just saying. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. So that is what the Old Testament, what the commandment said, okay? But Jesus bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Now when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone. Again, he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time, the older one first, until only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So we don't know for sure what he wrote on the ground. Some people think, well, it may be sins of the people. That'd be, you know, that's speculation. We don't know. But whatever it was, these that wanted to stone all of a sudden started to fall away with the older and then to the younger. But he just didn't say, I don't condemn you. But then he also said, leave your life of sin and sin no more. So you have both of those being exhibited by Jesus. So in all of this, thinking about some of the things that are coming, and again, not just 2023, but in the future, the coming shakings, the increase of that, increasing the darkness, is there an answer? Yes. That's why we really need to press in for first, revival. Revival for his church. To begin to revive a sleepy bride. If you think of somebody who went in a coma 10 years ago,